Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this very momentous and joyful occasion of discussing the post rural landscape in North Dakota. Um, today, I am joined by Senator Yana Myrdal, who is the leader of the Pro-Life Caucus in North Dakota, and also Christopher Dodson, the Executive Director of North Dakota Catholic Conference. And we are going to briefly discuss the Dobbs decision, um, and then we are going to go into um, discussion about the laws in North Dakota, how the decision has affected us here in North Dakota, and how it will continue to change the landscape of life in North Dakota, and then answer some common questions about all of these different decisions and laws and moving pieces that are happening here in North Dakota, and hopefully give you some solid answers that you can use to communicate with people that you are coming into contact with um, in your everyday life. So welcome, Senator Yana Myrdal and Christopher Dodson. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And first of all, I'm going to actually ask Chris to just generally go over the Dobbs decision and what it actually did, because it's not very complicated, is it? In the end, it's not. So what was the actual ruling from the Supreme Court in the Dobbs decision? The case involved a statute in Mississippi um, that prohibited abortions after 15 weeks gestation. The court could have simply found a way, well, not simply, but it could have found a way to uphold the ban after 15 weeks. But the problem is um, that doing so goes squarely up against Roe and Casey, which are the two cases that control abortion jurisprudence up to June 24th. Um, so the court was basically faced with an up or down. It either we overturn Roe and Casey or um, we uphold them and um, strike down the Mississippi law. The court ruled 6-3 to uphold the Mississippi law and 5-4 to overturn Roe and Casey. Effectively, what that means is that abortion law can now be decided by the states, that there is not a constitutional right to abortion in the U.S. Constitution. It corrects an injustice that was done in Roe and returns the issue to the states. It does not find a, um, um, a right uh, of life for the unborn. It does not ban abortion. It simply returns the issue to the states. Thank you. So with that, a common question that we're getting here at North Dakota Rates of Life is, is the Mississippi 15 weeks a law or is that legal? How does that work? I've got some people who have asked, so because the Mississippi case is upheld, what do, what do we do with the 15 weeks? Well, in Mississippi's case, uh, the 15 weeks, um, uh, ban um, became what we call enforceable. When we talk about constitutional, what we mean is whether it's enforceable or not enforceable. It became enforceable after um, the final order, which actually takes a little longer. The decision by the court is just an opinion on the law, and then the lower court has to issue an order based on that decision. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Mississippi had a trigger ban um, and since the issue went back to the states, their trigger ban went into effect last night um, and abortions ended entirely in Mississippi and the abortion center there closed. Um, essentially, their trigger ban um, tr trumped or mm -hmm. made the 15 week ban moot. OK, thank you. Well, and that gives us a perfect segue into talking to Senator Yana Myrdal, who is the head of our Life Caucus here in North Dakota. Senator, speaking of triggers and different laws and things that we have in place, where is North Dakota sitting right now, currently? Well, actually, very, very well on this issue. Uh, first of all, we stand on shoulders to those who fought this battle. Mm -hmm. First and foremost of all, in prayer for the life of the unborn and their mothers but also in service to the pre-born and the newborn and their moms throughout our pregnancy help centers that are all over the state and also by lawmakers. And uh, 
in my conversations with our current attorney general, he says it's pretty perfunctory for him to act on these three bills that uh, were on the books in North Dakota. Um, we had two trigger bills. Um, they basically trigger upon a, an event that happened by the Supreme Court if Roe and Casey was overturned. So they trigger into effect. And the way we put it in the law here in North Dakota is that they trigger into effect 30 days after the North Dakota Attorney General certifies mm -hmm. uh, that the Roe and Casey were overturned, that the Supreme Court decision actually does that, right? So he has already done that. Uh, the mm -hmm. current Attorney General, uh, Drew Wigley, has already done that and brought it up to Legislative Council. Uh, it does not take any action of the lawmakers, legislators, or uh, the Supreme Court, North Dakota, nor the uh, governor's office. It's an absolute, brilliantly uh, written trigger bill. Um, so he's already done that. So those bills go into effect July 28th, period. Um, however, Mackenzie, there's another law that isn't being spoken much about that was passed uh, about 10 years ago called the Heartbeat Bill. Um, that particular law uh, traveled through the courts, if you will call it that, all the way to the Eighth Circuit Court. And uh, the Eighth Circuit Court put an injunction against that law. So basically said we, we cannot allow it to stand However, Christopher remembers this, and some of us old ones remember that that opinion back then actually also sort of chastised the Supreme Court and said, North Dakota should be able to do this. You need to deal with something. So to me, that was one of the first breakthroughs in the legal world, if you will, that said, hey, wait a minute, Supreme Court, we should be able to allow North Dakota to do that. So the process for that particular bill is that our attorney general need to engage the court, basically, and ask for that injunction to be lifted because it has no legs to stand on anymore, because the reason it was put a hold on was because of Roe and Casey, mm -hmm. right? So that is in progress as well, and that could happen actually uh, before the 20th of July. We don't really know that process fully, mm -hmm. but our attorney general is actively pursuing it. Thank you. One of the questions in this whole process um, that I've been getting a lot from some of our members and people across our state is, why did we, why did we put in the 30 days for the trigger? Why didn't we just say that as soon as uh, Roe was overturned that North Dakota would be abortion free? What was the reasoning behind the 30 days? Well, Christopher can answer this too, but back then, and I was lobbying back then, Christopher and a few of the current lawmakers were there. Um, it takes a little time, right? We get the announcement from the Supreme Court, but that's just the PR part of it. And then it takes a few weeks, usually about 30 days for those laws to sort of trickle down the paperwork, all the stuff that goes with it, mm -hmm. down to the states. And I'm actually glad we did. Uh, I know people wanted immediate effect. Uh, we waited 49 years for this and 60 million lives, and it, 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 and it was tough to wait another few weeks. However, I think uh, the people who needed to know, including the abortion industry, knew that this was coming. They're already packing up and moving. Um, and we needed to give our attorney general time, whoever it would be at, at that point, right? to make sure we cross the T's and dot the I's and write these, uh, the, like the circuit court, all these documents absolutely correctly. So there's no lawsuits and no no ambiguity in the law, right? So that's, I think that was wisdom on behalf of the mm -hmm. legislators and the governor at the time, and I applaud them for that. Yes, I think so. Chris, did you have anything to add to that? Um, we actually rewrote the trigger in um, 2019, I think or 2017 yeah. uh, and added those 30 days um, because it was kind of the model of triggers around the country because of what that process I talked about. Mm -hmm. That a Supreme Court opinion is just an opinion, but the final order happens later. And if we had tried to do it sooner, there was always the risk that the abortion lobby would go back to court and said that we put the cart before the horse. Gotcha. Yes, no, and I think that that is like Yana had said before, that's very wise. Because I too was in that camp. I was like, why aren't we just abortion free? But the, you, know, you have to think about it and all those moving pieces. And we want to make sure that we are very, very solid in where we stand in North Dakota. And I thank and applaud the legislators and the lobbyists who you know had that foresight. So thank you. Um, so with all of this excitement um, and North Dakota set to become abortion free, July 28th, um, where does that leave us with 
you know, a lot of talk is about the exceptions and things with the current pieces of legislation that will go into effect. Um, Chris, would you want to walk us through some of the exceptions there? Sure. The Okay, we talked about the two trigger laws. Mm -hmm. um, one was what I call the comprehensive trigger ban that was passed in 2007. And then the dismemberment ban, uh, which was, um, I think, 2017 or 2019. And basically, that's rendered moot because the other one overlaps it. Okay. Uh, the that comprehensive trigger ban um, has an exception for rape, incest, and life of the mother. If the heartbeat ban goes into effect, it only has an exception for life of the mother. Normally, the latter enacted and the more specific controls if there's a conflict in the law. Um, so I think the heartbeat ban would trump and there would be um, no exceptions except for life of the mother at any time after a heartbeat. Um, and the comprehensive trigger ban would only apply before cardiac activity. The um, I read yesterday in the Fargo Forum that the Attorney General seems to agree with that analysis. There was just a brief little um, uh, summary of a statement by him, um, and I think that's that's good to see because the legislature is presumed to have known what it did back in 2007. Mm -hmm. So when it passed the heartbeat ban, it meant in um, legal terms to have that trump the 2007 law. What that means when you put it all together is that um, abortion would be banned ex um, throughout pregnancy, except for the life of the mother, and except for rape and incest within the first six weeks or so. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's a common question that you know we're getting here at North Dakota Right to Life for members is, well, so we have exceptions for rape and incest or we don't and trying to explain all of that. And thank you for putting that. So I think what we're, what we're, we don't, we don't know for sure, but I think when it all settles down, mm -hmm. that'll be what we have a rape and incest exception for the first six weeks. Um, and if the legislature wants to clarify that even more, they have the obligation. I mean, they have the uh, ability to do that. It's their prerogative. Um, but that's what they intended, if you look at the large, the longer picture mm -hmm. of the legislative history. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So with all of this and the Dobbs decision, the pieces of legislation that we have in North Dakota, um, there's a lot of questions and a lot of, I hate to use this terminology, but it's their terminology, the misinformation. And um, there's a lot of questions that we have as pro-life people in our stance. And, you know, one of the first ones that I hear a lot of and I see a lot of um, on social media and everything is, you know, this is going to criminalize women who are seeking abortion um, and that they're going to be prosecuted. So. Is that really the case here in North Dakota? Does this really criminalize abortion and lead to the prosecution of women in North Dakota? Chris, you want to take that one? Absolutely not. The, the statutes explicitly punish only the abortionist um, and ex prohibit prosecuting the women explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, all the all the laws. Right. The and other thing. The other thing I want to add to that is I've gotten some phone calls from media uh, mm -hmm. nationally and certainly here in, in North Dakota where they, you know, tend to fear monger and misinformation mm -hmm. correct of issues that they never cared about before. The abortion industry, like miscarriages, are we going to police miscarriages? Are we going to police a doctor for optopic pregnancies? Um, the abortion industry never cared about that. And all of a sudden in the last two weeks, they're really concerned. Uh, of course not. And uh, the other thing is women traveling out of state. So uh, again, we're not going to have a, a wall on the, around the border of North Dakota with police asking what you drank and what you ate and what medical procedures you might or might not have had uh, when you left the state. So again, that's fear mongering. And it's a, a minute, minute number of pregnancies that end up in uptopic pregnancies. And of course, the doctor uh, will take care of that patient. As a matter of fact, it's not even qualified as a pregnancy in medical terms. 
because it isn't in the uterus, right? Attached to the uterine wall. So these are fear-mongering uh, things that I think our pro-lifers need to be aware of and, and stand up against. Yes. And that was another common question that, you know, does this mean that women won't receive care for ectopic pregnancy or miscarriage? And that is absolutely false. Well, and it's, it's not included in the definition. It's not explicitly excluded in the definition um, in the trigger bills, but it's included in the definition of abortion because it says abortion is um, the termination of a pregnancy. And technically, an ectopic pregnancy is not a pregnancy because the um, fertilized egg, the, uh, the embryo zygote, does not implant in the uterus, which is the definition of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. The medical groups understood that at the time, and that's why they stayed neutral on the bill. They, they thought it was clearly excluded. Um, in addition, untreated it threatens the life of the mother and there's a life of the mother exception the um heartbeat ban which uses the definition of the abortion control act of another section of the code um, not only says that it's a termination of an intrauterine pregnancy to make it clear mm -hmm. it added it as another sentence and also not ectopic pregnancy so um it's clearly yeah um not affected at all in our decor. Right. And by the way, it, well, I could go into another legal reason. But no, yeah. Okay, if, if treating an ectopic pregnancy was considered an abortion, they would have to, for the last several decades, follow all the rules that we have regarding abortions. Um, parental consent and time periods and mm -hmm. informed consent requirements and location requirements and so on. I mean, we have like 20-something laws on the books that regulate abortion mm -hmm. uh, and it hasn't stopped them yet i mean they've been treating ectopic pregnancies in north dakota for the last 10 decades if a, laws on abortion haven't um had a chilling effect on treating ectopic pregnancies for the last 20 years the new law is not going to especially when it explicitly excludes ectopic pregnancies exactly yes exactly and that that's a really good point too i didn't even think about that in the past we have, you know, nobody's been barred from practice for those specific instances. Um, another question that comes up or seems to be included in the fear mongering, as Senator Muirdal said, is does this decision open the door to making contraception, IVF, interracial marriage, and or same sex marriage illegal? The decision? Yes. No, um, no, because they didn't decide that. And mm -hmm. It is true that Clarence Thomas wrote a concurring opinion with language which we call dicta, meaning it has no control. It's mm -hmm. not bearing on the case, um, saying that maybe he would revisit those and the, um, the substantive due process issues, but it's mm -hmm. not part of the opinion. It's one man's view. Mm -hmm. And um, those would take other cases and so on. And also the problem with that thinking is he was only talking about um, whether the right of privacy should be looked at again. Mm -hmm. But after Casey, abortion wasn't based on the right of privacy. It was based on a due process issue, a liberty clause, and uh, this concept of liberty. Uh, so the decision has nothing to do with the privacy issue. It had already been struck down by Casey. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat complicated, but it's, it's just fear-mongering. Yeah, is what it is. Exactly. Plus, the other thing, Mackenzie, is that any of those other issues would have to go up the court system, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the Mississippi law has taken a while. It goes to court, then it goes to district court, then it goes to, you know, da da da, and it, it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. So, so this notion that, that uh, a court, the Supreme Court, can just swing a whip and go boom, 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 it's just a lack of understanding and, and, and they're promoting a lack of understanding of the court and the system, correct? They're well, and also, it has to, yeah, Lana, Yana's right. It has to start with, before it even gets to court, it has to start with legislation. There is an interesting um, poll out that shows um, how Americans feel comfortable with various type of issues, contraception, mm -hmm. gambling, um, same-sex marriage, and so on, and then abortion. Abortion was so different in the public's mind than all of those other issues that there's not political will anywhere probably in the country 
to address those other issues. Mm -hmm. Abortion was and always is and always will be different from those type of issues because it involved another human life. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, um, you know, I've read the opinion a few different times and nowhere, and I believe it's Justice Alito's, you know, he's very, um, you know, clear that this has nothing to do with anything other than abortion. And it's repeated several times in his opinions and others that, you know, this is different because it involves the life of a, another human being. And that seems to get left out quite a bit. Well, you know, I, I read a thing the other day that says human rights, which everybody is concerned about, right? The yeah. left, right? Anybody. How can you have human rights if you don't have humans? So uh, a human life. So I think, I think, in the conscience of America and most people, I think I think that is just a fundamental fight. And I think Chris is right. Abortion has been that fight, has been a lightning rod for, for 50 years or more in, in not just the United States, but in other nations and will continue to be so. And we're at a victory stage right now, but it's a new beginning of the fight for life, right, Mackenzie? And you know that. Absolutely. It is. And, um, you know, it's such an exciting time that... Um, you know, like you said, the, the work is just beginning. And, um, you know, with that, what are some things that, you know, do you think, well, one of the things, you know, another question kind of leading back to some of the things that are being talked about on um, in the media and such, you know, women are losing their rights and that they're losing their health care. And again, that's just, simply not true. You know, here in North Dakota, we have seven crisis pregnancy centers and who provide a multitude of healthcare services, true healthcare services for the woman and the child. And, you know, the notion that we are eliminating these services and these women are not going to have resources and that, you know, it, we're taking away their rights and, you know, there's that whole Equal Rights Act thing that kind of falls into that as well. But, you know, here in North Dakota, we have so many resources in place. And, you know, I don't know if Chris or Jan, if you would want to speak to some of those resources, but then also the Alternatives to Abortion program. Yeah, I, I would love to. For First of all, uh, we know from statistics that poverty is not the number one or even top reason for having an abortion in North Dakota. So, so that's taken off the table pretty much. Uh, secondly, I think to call abortion health care is something that we need to correct. That is just a blatant lie. That's just the abortion industry has sort of stolen our language and taken that words. And it's not health care. Uh, life of the mother. Yeah, that's health care. And that's a rare, rare occasion. In, in pregnancy, and women know that, right? We're strong enough. Uh, I've always said we are strong enough. God made women strong enough that we can go through a crisis, even a crisis pregnancy or unwanted pregnancy, without bowing to the lowest common denominator of the abortion facility that says that, oh, I can't have a career, I can't be happy, I can't get a college education if, if I have a child. And, and we need to work on our culture of life in North Dakota to to defeat those lies, because it's just plainly not true. Women are stronger than that, and I've seen that in all the work I've done for 35 years. Secondly, as a lawmaker, and Christopher will add to this, I'm sure, I think we need to look at next session how we can undergird those women and families and fathers and unborn and uh, uh, newborn uh, children and families, but we need to do it as a state in partnership with the community in partnership very much with the church, right? When I say the church, I mean all denominations. And, and the churches need to step up, frankly. And I've told people in communities, if you're excited about this decision, then send $100 or $500 to your local crisis pregnancy center. And we have those scattered throughout the state of North Dakota. And this is not new to them, Mackenzie. We've been doing this work for 40-some years. These centers have been there uh, for women and served women and, and clients for decades upon decades. So this whole thing that the, the abortion industry also says that we're pro-birthers, we're not pro-life, it's just blatant lies. It's just not true. And uh, so as a lawmaker, I will I will look into funding for alternative to abortion to up that funding and also uh, get some more resources in from the state and 
in companionship with with the local churches and communities. And I think it's all of our responsibilities now. Uh, if you're pro-life, you can't be silent. Either you pray, you give, you serve, you volunteer, or you do something. And that's how we create a culture of life. Exactly. Christy, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not much. I, I do think we need to do more during this session. Mm -hmm. um, everybody does throughout our communities, families, businesses, um, communities, churches, private organizations, um, and government all need to step up um, so that no woman ever feels that abortion is the answer to her situation. Right. Yes. Now that we have the illegal portion of it here in North Dakota, the unthinkable and the culture shift and the communication and the education is going to be a big, big um, item going forward. The, with all of that, Chris, you have done an amazing job with a um, information campaign and an education campaign of who these women are and the women in North Dakota who are choosing abortion and the demographics and, you know, finding them and seeing them and loving them. And um, I would love for you to speak to that campaign of education that you've been putting out over the last, gosh, well, since January, really, and just really doing such an amazing job of saying, you know, who are these women? And how can we help them? And here's our plan going forward. So I'd love for you to speak to that piece. Thank you. Yeah, um, I've been collecting data from the uh, Department of Health for many years mm -hmm. and then asking them to you know, parse that out. For example, you can get from the public reports the um, number of what they call teenage women that get abortions. But I wanted to know how many were 17 and 18 or 19 versus, you know, how many were minors and um, and that information. And also what's important is, very important is to always look at abortion stats when they talk about abortion rate mm -hmm. as the number of abortions per pregnancies rather than the number of abortions per um, 1,000 fertile age women. Um, because you could get, uh, lower abortion rates with the latter type of data and the pro-abortion groups who claim it's gone down because of contraceptives. So you really need to look at how many pregnant women chose abortions and then look at their uh, data and try to find out who are they. Um, these are women that essentially we are missing with our current uh, pregnancy support system. Um, so I Put that together and in contemplation with the upcoming Dobbs decision, the bishop said, why don't you put this out in some way? Mm -hmm. And so I did a few talks and then we started putting it out on the website. And it, I broke it down in a series of 13 um, sort of factoids um, that can be looked at. And of course, I have a lot more data than that. Um, and they're on our website. Uh, you can find the link easily on the, the first page at ndcatholic.org and I've been posting it on Facebook and our e-newsletter and so on. We've got a good response. Um, there are about 833 women um, in North Dakota that get, uh, those are North Dakota residents that get abortions each year in North Dakota. Another 50 or so may go to Minnesota. Um, they tend to be not teenagers at all. They tend to be in their 20s, um, have some college education, um, unmarried, um, and they tend to have children already. Um, they tend to be white. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are black, if you um, are in the Fargo area, and of course, if you're unmarried, you're much more likely than a general population to choose abortion uh, when you crunch all the data and make comparisons. So we need, I sometimes think we need to rethink of how we're doing our work in the, um, uh, the pro-life community mm -hmm. um, to reach those women and um, maybe rethink about how we reach them, how we um, help them. 
Um, and this is information both for state agencies and the crisis pregnancy centers, the adoption agencies. Mm -hmm. and so, on. Mm -hmm. um, so the important thing is that these women are loved. They're loved by God and we need to love them as well. Um, so we called it um, Know Them, Love Them campaign. So we know something about them so we can know them personally and love them as our Holy Father does. Mm -hmm. Yes. When you first presented that in January at the Life Conference, it was just, for me, it was very pivotal in shifting my thinking and how, you know, who these women are and how, like you said, how are we going to love them here so that they, you know, love themselves and their children enough and, and how are we going to want you know find them? And then what are the resources that we need to provide for them to eliminate those stressors that cause them to think that abortion is their only option? So I just I commend you for that um, educational campaign because it's it, I I personally think that it is definitely um, so absolutely beautiful and so necessary for this time. Um, so thank you for that. Did, just to kind of wrap things up here, is there any other um, questions or things that you've been having to deal with or um, any pieces of information that you would want to communicate at this point before we close out? Oh, I'm seeing what? lots of questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I please, because this is this is why we're doing this. Is It is so important that we make resources available to answer so many of these questions in this uncertain yet beautiful time. So, yes, please. Well, I just want to make one quick comment, uh, not a question, but I, I think it's important for us that are, quote unquote, pro-lifers, right? That's a, mm -hmm. that's a subculture um, to reach out to people that aren't part of that, but they're still mm -hmm. pro-life. They're just silent. And I think that's a huge majority of North Dakotans in yeah. churches and church, you know, and I think we need to reach out to pastors and, and priests to say that we need to speak about this frequently in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to energize that that group because they're afraid to come out or be a pro-lifer. They're pro-life, but they don't want to be a pro-lifer. It's mm -hmm. kind of a cultural thing. And I think we need to encourage them to come out, to be involved, because we can't reach all these women. We can't make this a a state with a culture of life without those people that are now maybe supportive, but kind of silent. So that might be something we need to pursue. 100%. And just for that, um, North Dakota Right to Life, we have a campaign that we're starting to build and it's um, you know challenging the churches and becoming a champion yeah. for life, our ch champion churches program. And so we're pretty excited to be able to get that rolling this fall. But yeah, just calling these churches and these Christians and pro-lifers to really step up and, you know, being pro-life and doing pro-life. We need, we need doing pro-life right now. Exactly. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions. I get questions on telehealth. I get questions on traveling, abortifacients, contraception, and how North Dakota laws affect these. I could go into them all now, but, um, I'm always available. Contact us through our website, ndcatholic.org. Mm -hmm. um, ask the questions and I'm happy to answer. That's, that's what I do. Yes. Um, and um, so we're available and we're going to be available always to try to answer these questions and how the laws work. Mm -hmm. um, so don't accept what you're seeing online and letters, uh, gosh, the letters to um, the papers are con so much misinformation. Even the editorials. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, they just need to, they pick it, just need to pick up the century code and they can see the end that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have questions, please ask. Yes, absolutely. And um, when we get done with this, I'll be putting all of you know the links to obviously your guys' website, the links to the century codes and some different things and resources. Um, but yes, please reach out to Catholic Conference or North Dakota Right to Life and or you know Jan and with the Life Caucus, because there is a lot of information out there and there's correct information. You just need to ask. <laughs> so with all of this being said, what are some specific things, um, Yana, that you could give to people who are 
ready to do pro-life from a legislative standpoint or um, someone, you know, as a lawmaker or in that arena? What are some things or actionable items that individuals could do to um, help you and the legislature and um, the Life Caucus? Oh no, did she freeze? Well, roll to Chris. Chris, what are some things that um, you see as actionable items for people in our um, communities and our counties and our state and our parishes and churches to start doing pro-life? Uh, start with your family. Remember, um, always love, remember what you say around family members and what you do. That's where it starts, I think. Mm -hmm. And everybody needs to step up and help each other. The crisis pregnancy centers, the adoption agencies, um, they've raised, I don't know how much now to help the abortion center move to Moorhead. Think mm -hmm. of how that money could help our centers. We should be matching that. Um, um, it's, it's far more than the state gives to the abortion alternatives program by far. By far. So, um, we need to step up in our giving and our prayer life. And a lot of us have businesses. Mm -hmm. you know? We need to think our, about our family policies, um, the ability for people to get daycare. Remember, a lot of these women have children and are unmarried. They're struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and um, businesses have a role to play here. They do. And we need to um, start talking about that with each other. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, feel, have the courage to speak pro-life to mm -hmm. when you hear these things, answer them, say they're not true. Right. Um, or um, wait, you're forgetting the unborn child in this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, there's always the unborn child and there's not enough discussion about that in this debate right now. Correct. And th th that's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like, too, how you brought in the piece about, you know, the unborn child and then the businesses. And you know, we're seeing so many businesses who are offering services for their employees to go seek abortions. They're paying for them. They're, you know, it's just it's mind boggling from my perspective that that would be an alternative. And it doesn't even make sense. But businesses do have a role and there are, you know, I, I see a lot of things online about, you know, I'm for the single mom who can't have, you know, is financially in, struggling and all of these things. And, and that, you know, to them is a reason for abortion, but let's look at the root cause of that. And how do we fix the cause instead of, you know, basically eliminating the sufferer? We're not working on the suffering, but we're just going to eliminate the suffer or, you know, that just, we have to stand up and speak to those pieces. Correct. Um, is there any other items that you would like to discuss or go over before we close out today? Um, no, not unless you want me to go through all the questions I'm getting. <laughs> well, honestly, I, I am not opposed because I have a feeling we're getting a lot of the same questions and this is the perfect opportunity to yeah, try well, to get some of them. Um, we've been asked about will North Dakota laws affect fertility care and IVF? Um, no, they don't cover it at all. As we mentioned, they cover only the termination of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't affect, in fact, it's not regulated in any way, hardly in any state. Um, so North Dakota law will impact that. It won't impact um, the use of contraception. Um, there have been some questions about Plan B, um, mm -hmm. but um, while while Plan B and other abortifacients can act as an abortifacient and kill an unborn child, um, it happens before that implantation we talked about earlier. Yep. And so they're not affected by this law. In fact, trying to draft a law to prohibit abortifacients is difficult mm -hmm. because none of those drugs, none of them work entirely 
and always as an abortifacient. Sometimes they act as a contraceptive, sometimes they act as an abortifacient. And if you try to draft a law that would stop the abortifacient, you would ban all contraception. And that is not the legislature's intent. Um, right. So, um, and for telehealth, I'm getting questions about telehealth. Yes. Um, North Dakota law um, requires that the, both uh, regimens of the abortion drug regimen mm -hmm. um, be provided in person. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that even if all these laws go into effect, some abortions will be allowed and all the regulations that we have, including the ban on telehealth abortions um, and the reporting requirements, et cetera, still exist. Mm -hmm. um, which means that anybody who wants to do a, an abortion in those rare categories that would still be allowed would have to follow everything still on the books. Right. So the, the telehealth law, the, the, res, the re, restrictions we have on abortion drugs, the waiting periods, and so on would still apply. Okay. Um, that's a notification, parental consent, all those are still apply. Um, Oh, Yana's back. I'm back. They cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is just going over some more of his, the questions that he's been getting. Well, let's, yeah. let's go, Rihanna mentioned the traveling thing real quick. Um, again, the woman's not penalized. So why would we penalize her from traveling? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, if she gets an abortion here or in another state, she's still not penalized. So there'd be no interest in trying to restrict her travel and it'd be unconstitutional probably. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question about investigating miscarriages. Yes. Everything I said about um, the ectopic pregnancies and that we have laws now, uh, well, well, first, the first answer to the miscarriage thing is the woman's not penalized. Why would we inter be interested in her miscarriage? The second answer to that claim is we have all these laws now that regulate abortion and if you don't do every one of them it's a crime in mm -hmm. north dakota yeah and they haven't been investigating miscarriages for the last 20 and 30 years why would they start now exactly yeah, this makes no sense um so we have a history here to say the state's attorneys haven't been doing it before and why would they do it now especially since the woman's not penalized it just makes no sense mm -hmm. yes one thing I wanted to add, too, that I don't know if you talked about when I was gone, and it's a little political, maybe, but as a lawmaker, uh, this is a hugely bipartisan uh, legislation. The trigger bill and these bills were bipartisan. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. the main sponsor of the, the trigger bill back then uh, was a Democrat. So this is not a, a partisan issue in North Dakota mm -hmm. um, at all. And I think we need to, we need to kind of depoliticize this issue. Uh, they're trying to politicize the Supreme Court. I don't think that's proper at all. And they're trying to politicize this issue, and it isn't. It's an issue of life, and, it, and I think pro-lifers won, certainly, with this decision, but the Constitution won. Yeah. You know, and, and the justices didn't take anything away. They gave it back to the states, and I think that's important. So that will kind of eliminate some of those questions about you know, birth control and traveling and all those things. Uh, that, that's, that was not part of the decision at all. It gave it back to the state where it rightfully belongs. And, and that's yeah. kind of the simplicity of it. So, Yes. So some of the claims, uh, some people are saying, well, why don't, why don't these laws have health exceptions? Um, the problem with health exceptions, mine, mine also. The problem with, problem with health exceptions is that they can be interpreted so broadly. Mm -hmm. Um that it can include anything the woman and her physician thinks is in her best interest is how it's been interpreted by the court yeah. in the past. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, a good healthcare system that helps um, care for women throughout their pregnancy yeah. and try to um, preserve the life of the mother um, her best interest in healthcare through the pregnancy and the unborn child. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to add a health exception, which pits the mother against the unborn child. Yeah. Or, right. Um, but there, there is a clear life of the mother exception in these laws. And um, 
that's real. That's the real health exception. Okay. Another question is, is I'm getting, this gets a little complicated, but it's getting some attention now. So I want to bring it up is mm -hmm. the trigger law puts, uh, makes the exceptions an affirmative defense, meaning that the, the abortionist has the burden of proof to show that it met one of the exemptions, rape, incest, life of the mother. Mm -hmm. um, um, that was, the, the medical associations were there, they were in the meetings, they were in the halls, um, they didn't testify against the bills, mm -hmm. didn't testify at all, um, but they were there. Yeah. And so apparently they had no problem making it an affirmative defense. Exactly. And and when we have the heartbeat ban also applies, um, that's going to be a rare situation where it would ever come up anyway. Mm -hmm. How it will prove a um, if they have to prove a rape and incest? There, there, there's ways states attorneys work that out. I don't think they'd even bring a case if they can't show that it wasn't didn't fall under one of those categories. Right. Yes. What other questions are you getting? Or, Well, I'm getting questions from other lawmakers uh, quite a bit. And I understand that. Um, you know, you want to, you know, some are, are well thought out. Some are knee-jerk reactions uh, because, you know, they don't know the law. They weren't there. I mean, some of us old ones were there. But um, whether we should have new laws, you know, whether we should do this, A, Y, Z. Um and right now, I think I think we're we're going to visit about some things. Certainly, in the pro life caucus, you know, we need to to look at what we have. We need to look at after the twenty eighth of July and after the heartbeat is back reinstated. We need to look at language. Is there some tweaks maybe that we need to do to solidify what the language actually says in North Dakota? Likely so. Clean up bills, we call them, in, in the session. Uh, do we need some radical? Um, things that open up the whole uh, gamut again? I don't think so, personally. But one of the ones that people are concerned about is the rape and incest exceptions in the first mm -hmm. six weeks. And I share that. Um, it's something I think that the pro-abortion industry is going to bring up as, as their main concern. Mm -hmm. But for those that listen to this, um, we have, for I myself for 35 years, I've always said, okay, let's, let's meet Planned Parenthood. Let's uh, meet abortion industry. Let's sit at the table, right? And let's ban abortion in America, period, in every state, except the rape and incest. And I tell you what, nobody ever showed up. They ran to the hills, right? They're not interested. In, in, they don't care for the woman. Uh, it's an abortion industry. It's a billion-dollar annual industry. Uh, they don't care about the women at all, and we do. And so, again, uh, a child is a child, and I don't think women are so weak that we have to uh, punish our unborn child for, for a crime somebody else has committed. I think that's really important to explain. And as women, you and I, Mackenzie, and women need to speak up on this because I frankly am so tired of the left and the pro-abortion industry calling me a victim just because of the gender that God blessed me with. So uh, I'm not a victim and I'm strong enough and women are strong enough by God's grace to go through incredible hardships. And we have for thousands of years, whether it's maternal death, whether it's losing children, whether it's childbirth difficulties, we've gone through really hard things. And we can do that again to give life to our unborn children. So we as a community and as lawmakers uh, will look at that, certainly, um, and see what we can do. But there are just some minor tweaks maybe we can do. And we, we will get together and have conversations on that before the next session. Yes. No, definitely. I'm just so grateful for, like I said, the the thought and the process and the hope and the you know wisdom that put us in the position that we are in, in our state, um, because there are states who are scrambling right now. And by the grace of God and some very wise, hopeful people, we are, you know, set to become abortion free. And it is so amazing. I just want to give credit to Christopher though. He's been there through this entire process. And uh, I honestly don't know how the state of North Dakota would have done it without him. Just kudos. It's yes. so kudos absolutely. I, yeah, it's so crazy. And I'm so new to this. Like I'm like the new kid on the block, literally. And I just am overwhelmed by the amount of insight and wisdom and courage that, you know, happened way before I even 
came on the scene. And so I'm just very grateful to be a part of this new process that we get to look forward to because of what you know, Christopher has done and you know, you, Yana, and all of us who've been in, in this fight for almost 50 years. So it's very, very humbling. Um, and I love it. By the grace of God and keeping keeping our eyes on the prize that we yeah. knew had already been won on the cross. And it was just mm -hmm. Amen. Absolutely. Staying on the path. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mackenzie. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm just grateful that you guys had time today to meet and do this little session. And I can't wait to have it out there and available to challenge um, not only our pro-life community to be pro-life, but to do pro-life and to give hope and correct truth. So I'm so grateful that you took time today for this. Thank you. Thank God you. bless. You too. Have a good day. Yeah.